Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. This is a Friday Frights episode where I step away from the creepy music, special sound effects, and intricate audio production. It's just you, me, this campfire, and stories that you, my Weird Darkness Weirdo family members, have sent in for me to share. If you have a true story that's happened to you or somebody you know and it's creepy, feel free to email it in to me, and I can consider it for a future Fireside Frights. To send in your story, just go to WeirdDarkness.com and click on Tell Your Story in the right-hand column. Or if you're on a mobile device, you might need to uh, just scroll down in order to find that. But click on Tell Your Story on the website, and it'll take you to the right page to send in your story. I'm, I'm kind of wishing that we did have music for tonight, because... I could really use some music in my head. I have been. <laughs> this has nothing to do with the with the uh, the stories at all. I'm just I'm just sharing. But I have had the soundtrack from West Side Story stuck in my head for the last week and a half, and I just can't get rid of it. I even posted on Facebook the other day about my which which of the of the versions of of the soundtrack, either like the original movie or the Broadway production or the remake movie, you know, which ones were better and everything else. I thought maybe posting that, you know, would just get it off of my, get out of my mind and I could move on. Nope. I'm still stuck with tonight, tonight, will, won't be just any night. I, I can't even get the words right right now. Anyway, it's, <laughs> it's, stuck, in, it's stuck in my head. And, and the, the, the hard part is I don't know all the words, but I know the tune. So it's just the tune that's stuck in my head and only a portion of the tune. Like it's just like the, the hook or the chorus and it just keep, just hits on repeat over and over. And it's the earworm. I hate, hate hate earworms. Okay, anyway, moving on. You're not here for that. You know, I, I, I just needed to vent to somebody. <laughs> and my wife doesn't care. <laughs> anyway, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. We begin with uh, Genocide Doll. Genocide Doll has actually emailed us a few times with her stories. And she and I do not dis uh, do not agree on everything. You'll understand why here in just a second. But she, here's what she writes. Hello, it's me again, along with my emotional support demon. We are not so ignorant or insecure to become threatened and run if our views don't match. I still enjoy the podcast. I still plan to listen in. I don't think he's a demon in the way you think he is, but he's kept me alive, safe, and happy. I've experienced more harm from people of faith and humans in general than from things that go bump in the night. I don't believe in God or the Christian devil. Any reference to it is sarcasm, but I do have faith in things like spirits, deities, and other non-human beings. I have beliefs, which I could get into, but this is another long story, which is basically a dream I had one time when I was a wee little potato-sized child. All right, but before we get into your your story, um, Jen, it is, it's a demon. I know you don't believe in the, in the Christian devil, Christian God, but if let's let's just, for example, say that that spirits, deities, and other non-human beings exist, where did they come from? Something had to create them. Even if you go all the way back to the Big Bang, and that's all where it all started, something had to trigger that. It's it's the rule of cause and effect. If you're going to have the effect of the bang, you needed the cause. And only something that is eternal and completely out of time would have been able to start that. And I don't necessarily believe in the Big Bang and the millions of years and everything else. That, that's, a, that's a different story. But regardless of your, of your faith, if you believe that something exists, where did that thing come from? 
it go back in your mind okay that 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 came from this other thing okay well where did that other thing come from well it came from the thing before that okay well where did that come from and just keep going back just keep going back and eventually you're gonna have you come to, you'll have to come to the realization that you can't go back through eternity through infinity it there that doesn't work there has to have been a beginning and for there to be a beginning there had to be something to trigger that beginning so that's all that to say and your demon i do think he's a demon in the way that i think Sa satan can come as an angel of light i was even listening to um one of, one of my absolute favorite bible teachers is dr um adrian rogers i i kind of use him as part of my bible study each morning He's got a uh, he's got a podcast. He's he's been gone for a long time. Um, he he passed away many years ago, but they still um, produce his um, radio show and also le release it as a podcast in Canada. And I was I'm able to get the one from the uh, podcast from Canada version. It's called um, Love Worth Finding. If you ever want to look for it, that's what I use right. That's what I'm using right now for my daily Bible study. Um, and he was just talking about this this morning. Actually, on the the the, uh, the the episode I was talking about today, about whether or not the devil likes religion or not, and the devil loves religion, and the reason he loves religion is exactly what you're saying here, Jen. The people of faith, uh, you know, they're the ones that have burned you. Well, those aren't true Christians, or they're not acting in a Christian manner. At least, religion has burned you. And that I understand. And the devil loves religion because it takes people away from the truth. Religion is something that's man-made. It's all these different rules that we that we make up and say, well, you have to live this way if you're going to make it to heaven. you got to live this way if you're going to make it to heaven. It doesn't work that way. It's all by grace. It's just faith in Jesus, what he's done for you, just taking, just just believing what he what he what he did, that he rose from the dead. And that he is that he died for our sins. That's it. That's all you got. That's all you got to know. The rest of it is secondary issues, and people get so caught up in it, and it turns people away. And and I'm very very sorry that that's happened to you, Jen. I I can't tell you how many people I come I uh, I talk to who who hate God's people because of the way they've been treated. Just know that that they are not the representative of God. You can't take the, you can't take the the worst person in a classroom and base the entire classroom on that one person. You can't take an entire nation and say, well, there's that one bad person over there, and so your entire nation sucks. Please don't do that. Um, unfortunately, the people who do the bad things are the ones that usually get all the press, and that's why you hear about them more often. Okay, anyway, moving on. All right. Jen says, I have a great story that you would love, or at the very least, find intriguing. Way back in the day when I was a dumb teen, I used to date this guy in high school who lived in a really haunted house. The upper levels weren't bad. Haunted, but not bad. However, the basement was bad. The upper levels had been haunted by a little girl, possibly eight or ten. We never saw her, but could feel her around sometimes, or from the corner of our eyes. Though she had run of, uh, though she had run of the house, she kept to upstairs or the living room. When this mother was sad one night, she felt a little hand on her leg, and felt that someone was sitting on the bed. She felt comforted and a little less sad. Sometimes, when I would go over, my invisible friend would spend time with the little ghost girl. She was scared of him at first, because she didn't like men, but he eventually gained her trust. While I was hanging out with my boyfriend, playing, a video, uh, playing video games, my friend would play with the little girl, keeping her attention away from the basement. Man, you're just scaring me, Jen. The whole idea that you're, that you're bringing this demon with you, and now it's playing with the little girl? That, ugh, okay, anyway. Um, it wasn't a big deal until my boyfriend at the time moved into the basement, and going to his house was much less fun. Specifically, walking down the steps to the basement would affect the women mostly, but everyone could feel something in the area around that. It was difficult to ignore, but was more tolerable in certain parts of the basement. 
In the basement, you could feel the vibe become heavy and cold. It'd feel like something ominous was staring you down, like a hungry animal wanting to rip you apart, but it was caged and could only stare. Hungry, furious, hate-filled. In the basement, you would suddenly feel like a small prey animal walking out into an open field with owl eyes glowing in the trees, or like a lone woman walking to her car in an empty parking garage after work. That was before they found and opened the uh, they, that was before they found and opened the closed off crawl space under the stairs. During some work on the doing <laughs> sorry folks, doing some work on the house, the boyfriend's stepdad needed to get under the stairs, which meant he had to take down this wall that had been put up many years before they moved in. Turns out the wall was a few layers thick with very old and rotten wood behind some modern plaster. In the super old wood across in the super old wood, a cross had been carved into it, but was torn down anyway. In this small crawl space under the stairs to the basement, the stepfather found a Bible and I think a rosary. I'm not a follower of the God in that variation of faith, but I do believe in the power of faith in symbols. Bibles, crosses, rosaries are powered by the belief of the person, and to use them in a ritual was powerful magic. It's not so much the religion or the symbols, but the person and how they use their energy to power the ritual. Regardless of the symbols, I know better than to mess with an obvious sealed cage. I was thinking the same thing while you're writing that. You got a cross on this, and you got a rosary and a Bible. Somebody's trying to keep something in, the, in there. Uh, unfortunately, it I, I couldn't stop it, and my friend could only shield me and the little girl ghost. Again, the friend would be would be her invisible demon. Uh, once that wall was broken and the items removed, the ominous feeling took over the house. The stepdad said it felt like something moved past him when he disturbed the items and he regretted it. He put those back in, but it was too late. The thing was out of its cage and it was in the house. We wouldn't see him, but we saw him as a dark-haired man, tall, angry, dripping with hate. In our mind's eyes, we saw him, male figure, cold, dark, empty, and evil. My friend would block him, and they would often glare at each other from across the room. All women, except the mom, could feel this hate and desire to harm. He was pure evil. Makes you wonder why the mom didn't feel that weird. Some research was done on the house, which was a remodeled farmhouse. Some rooms had been torn down and others put in, which explained why the house was so awkwardly put together. Rooms didn't really match. Stairs from a hall right into a bathroom. Weird gaps between walls that should have been an extra foot of room. It seemed that several generations ago a family lived in the house before the remodeling started, but they lost a child to murder. The uncle of the girl had harmed her in ways that made people happy that she didn't survive. I don't think we found anything about the uncle's arrest, but he wasn't alive very much longer after that. Much of this is speculation because we had to piece together things from historical sources that had the bare minimum of information. I tried not to spend so much time at his house after that, but my home life became harder. My friend was often tired after dealing with the farmhouse murderer. He really wanted me to end things with my boyfriend, who was a terrible boyfriend, honestly, but I thought that guy was better than none. Uh, I, I thought that guy was better than none. I thought no one else wanted to date me, but I found out later the boyfriend got out of the friend zone by telling everybody that we had already been dating, but wanted to keep it secret because my parents didn't like him. Classy. I thought I was listening to my heart by ignoring the emotional support demon urging me to leave this guy, but turns out I was listening to my depression and self-destructive urges. Yay. See, dumb teen. ESD. Uh, emotional support demon. She's just shortened it to ESD. ESD had to work extra hard to keep me safe when I eventually moved in with the boyfriend. I had my own mini shield of protection, but it wore thin after all the emotional abuse from the boyfriend. My ESD had to get some outside help, and it wasn't long before we made a new human meat friend. Made a human meat friend. He noticed I had someone with me, and we started to talk about spirits and fairy folk. I got I got I got to go back to that sentence. It wasn't long before we made a new Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I was picturing in my head that you were actually putting like a Frankenstein monster. You were putting something together out of meat to make a new friend. I see what you mean then. 
<laughs> what you mean is you uh, you finally made a new friend who was an actual human being. Okay, now, now I got it. You were just you were using colorful language. You just threw me. Okay, anyway, um, he noticed I had somebody with me, and we started to talk about spirits and fairy folk. The new the new friend. Okay, we eventually got him to come over, and as soon as he walked in the door, he was shocked by how bad this thing was. I felt like the thing under the stairs fed on stress, sadness, and fear. This house was full of it. The older brother was in, or used to be, in gangs, but still kept drinking, doing the drugs, and being an idiot with no drive to do anything but be a drain on his family and cheat on every girlfriend he had. The stepdad was a depressed, overworked, lonely man who was trying to, to love his wife, who thought buying junk she didn't need on sale was equal to saving money. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm not going there. Uh, it was her idea to get this money pit fixer-upper house because it called to her. Uh, I bet it did. This woman uh, had, had lived a lifetime of high stress, abuse, and was under a blanket of negativity for so long that she normalized it. The thing under the steps probably saw her coming from miles away. Our new meat friend came over a few times just to hang out uh, to a hang with us, and him and I would talk about magic and other things. My boyfriend didn't believe that stuff, but thought it was cute for me. After a while, our new friend stayed with us a few days. I knew my ESD was hanging out with him while I was sleeping. I woke up and felt some... Uh, oop, lost my place there. Ah, I woke up and felt something was different. I found my human friend awake, but looking very tired, yet happy. He was always happy, just a happy, positive person who had some pain he was trying to deal with. Unfortunately, he used drugs to dull that pain. Turns out my ESD and him helped the little girl move on. Her fear had been feeding the thing under the stairs, and he was keeping her trapped. It seemed to take a toll on both of them, and for several days they both rested. My boyfriend eventually got a job, and I was just hanging out with a happy, sad human friend. Happy, sad human friend. It's an odd, odd phrase. I know what you mean, but it's just an odd thing to say. Um, I was writing on the computer a short story on my day off, trying to ignore the presences of the evil ghost. My ESD was with me, but he was still tired. I did my best to help him along with my human friend when we felt a shift in the room. My friend was basically slapped out of his meditation, and the right side of my face felt numb and tingling, but I could still feel fingers stroking my face. It wasn't a nice stroking of fingers like the caressing of someone who cares, but more menacing, like when the stalker finally traps their obsession and can now do whatever they want with them. At this point in my life, I was in a deep depression, feeling sad when something was wrong, thinking I deserved it. I had tuned out my ESD because I thought I deserved to be miserable, and you can't help someone who had chosen to just lay down and die. I thought my friend was near, but it was so subtle, so distant, that I couldn't see him. I could barely hear him, and I felt he was fading. This change was him finally breaking. He was trying to protect me, trying to keep me safe, and I would walk right back into the burning house that was this relationship and situation. I realized he was hurting too. I let him take a beating and would dismiss his efforts by letting myself suffer. He broke, but was still trying to fight, but instead of sad, I felt angry this time. I got angry and looked at my human friend. He knew something shifted in me. My face still felt tingly, but I pushed away the fingers. In my mind, I broke them. In my mind, a wall of shadows surrounded me, and the shadows formed tooth-filled maws, ripping bits off the evil man. The energy changed. We could still feel him, but it felt like before when it was only under the steps. My ESD was proud of me, and I maintained my own shield to protect me. Over the course of a few days, the vibe of the house changed. I wasn't home as much because work, but I could feel it one day it was gone. It was over. The thing under the steps was gone. My human friend and ESD worked together to rip into this evil thing, bind him, and my ESD took it to a place where he should have gone before, a place he deserved but didn't think he did. ESD came back after a few days, and the house didn't have the sense of dread. The boyfriend's mom started to lose her hysterical need to cling to the house. She lost that feeling of it being her home and was simply a house that was a money pit. 
I eventually broke up with that boyfriend, but we remained friends after some time of me just not keeping the relationship going. Paths are forged when two people walk through obstacles, not just one person trying to clear things while carrying the partner. I still made mistakes, not listening to my ESD, and ended up with harmful partners, but time wasted on them was shorter. My mental health would improve when I didn't live with my parents and they slowly gave up doing the church thing, which actually led us to having a better relationship. My bio mother's partner was still a narcissistic um, jerk, but she's dead now and mom no longer has to deal, uh, that family of deal with that family of entitled, self-righteous, greedy, perverted psychopaths. They are the best example of the worst people of faith. They talked the lines that fit what they wanted, but didn't walk a straight line. Can't stand those kinds of people. You and me both, Jen. That, that's exactly what I was talking about earlier. Um, it, we're all hypocrites in, in some way. I mean, it's just because none of us are perfect. We all sin. But people like that who kind of boast about their faith and then walk all over people like that, that those, those are the ones that... Uh, never mind. Don't get me started. Anyway, um, hope she says, I uh, hope that wasn't too long of a rambling mess and at the very least interesting. I have a few more stories that would probably be interesting for a later day. I really want to get more fictional stories written. Hopefully I can hear them here someday. People say the greatest trick the devil ever pulled... Uh, let me try that again. People say the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was making people think he wasn't real. I think it was successfully taking the blame for human free will and the horrible things they do. Or removing and reattaching his thumb. Blows my mind. Wow. Removing and reattaching his thumb. Cute. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. I appreciate it. Yeah, you and I, of course, don't have... Don't, we don't see eye to eye on, on things, but... You know what? You're, you're a great writer. I, I love what you send in, and uh, I love sharing it, so please feel free to send it in again. And I need to write down... I'm going to... I have, a, I have a, the app, the uh, Uversion Bible app, that I, that I need to start spend, spending more time on, but I'm going to put down your name so I can start praying for you on a regular basis. I keep telling myself I'm going to do that, but then I forget... Now I write it down, so now I can do it. Okay. This next one comes from... Let's see. I want to make sure she doesn't want to stay anonymous. Okay, great. Uh, this one comes from uh, Arthur and Tammy. Okay, but this one comes from Tammy. Okay. My husband and I lived in Estes Park. Beautiful place, by the way, Tammy. Oh, uh, we, uh, we drove through there um, last year uh, for, as part of the, the Weird Darkness road trip. And... Uh, at, there's no way we'd ever live there. It is way, <laughs> is way too expensive. But boy, that place is gorgeous. Okay, anyway. My husband and I lived in Estes Park, and I drive every night to the park to enjoy the top of Trail Ridge Road. The sunsets lasted forever. The night was past midnight, and we watched the stars and the glow from the city of Denver was in my rearview passenger mirror. I waited for my husband as he stepped out to relieve himself on the pavement behind the car. I saw his silhouette near the trunk and wondered... What was taking so long? As I thought this, the driver door opened up and in came Hubby. I felt full chills. I was scared to look again to see that giant silhouette. How did I see what I thought my husband was in the mirror? Or how did I see what I thought was my husband in the mirror as he was getting in the car? It felt very menacing. Husband didn't see it, but when he saw my face say, hurry, we'd hurriedly left the parking lot. We know how we shouldn't disrespect the sacred places by urinating on it. The Trail of Tears in the area was there. Estes Park area was a sacred hunting area, and women and children left early every fall to Lake Granby, uh, Granby area to prepare for winter. On that same general area, we had a pine cone thrown horizontally at us through the thick firs by a small alpine pond. No way that wasn't thrown hard, but from where? We were supposed to, we were surrounded by thick, thick Christmas tree type pines just below the timberline. I have more stories I'll submit later. Thanks for letting me share. Sincerely, Arthur and Tammy. Thank you, Tammy. Um, I appreciate that. I don't, I wouldn't say that you were disrespecting the, uh, the, the trail of tears. I know, I mean, urinating on a gravestone, something like that. Yeah, totally. But it's not like people on the trail of tears didn't have to stop on that route and relieve themselves either. It's just part of human nature. 
Um, if you were, if if your husband was aiming at something particular that could have been disrespectful, maybe. But if it's just on the pavement, uh, it wouldn't be any dis any more disrespectful than the pavement being there in the first place. Just my two cents. Okay, moving on to Tony. Uh, Tony in color. Hey, another Colorado guy. Uh, hey, Darren, I was listening to Fireside Frights on May 3rd. That was our last one, actually. It's been that long since we've done one of these. Uh, and you mentioned your cat, Miss Mocha Monster. Well, I have a cat story I hope you enjoy. I was working in the receiving department at the local Humane Society in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Again, gorgeous area. Uh, a woman came in carrying a male orange and white tabby cat that was doing his best to get away from her. I rushed over to the woman with a carrier, and as soon as I took the cat in my arms, it stopped struggling and started purring. This cat had picked me to be his next owner, and there was nothing I could do. I looked the cat over. Turned out he had an eye infection so bad his eyes were no bigger than a pencil eraser, and he was blind. I knew I had to save him. The Humane Society policy for stray animals is to hold them for a period of five days to give the owner a chance to reclaim them. Well, this orange tabby was not being claimed, so I put my name down to adopt him because of how he had reacted to me when he had been brought in. I found a great veterinarian who was willing to treat his blindness and neuter him at the same time. Turned out, the only way to treat his eyes was to remove them, and so his eyelids closed. Oh man, that's sad. While well, that happened, co-workers told me that a blind animal would be a hard task, but I knew what I had to do. I brought the cat home, and that night my wife and I were watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine uh, threw the cat on the floor in front of my TV. My wife made the comment that the new cat, the orange tabby, looked like the character Odo from Deep Space Nine. <laughs> uh, immediately, the orange tabby turned his head into the direction of my wife and walked towards her. We knew that Odo was his name. Despite his blindness, nothing stopped Odo. He would wrestle the other animals, he would wander all over the apartment and always end up in the window basking in the sun. When we, uh, when we bought our house, he always held his own and there was no place he did not explore. From the beginning, Odo had known he was supposed to go home with me and be my cat. He always greeted me when I came home from work, came up and cuddled in my lap whenever he sensed I had a bad day. Odo, uh, Odo lived to the ripe old age of 20 and passed away in his sleep while laying under my favorite chair. Odo helped me understand cats on a whole new level. I understand now that people don't pick out their pet cats. Cats pick out their pet people. Also, the most important thing people need to know about cats is that cats are reincarnated people in fur coats who didn't get what they wanted the first time in life. Keep up the great work and the podcast coming. Your fellow weirdo in Christ, Tony in Colorado. Well, I think you're probably joking about cats being reincarnated people, but that's, that, is, <laughs> that is cute. Yeah, they, def they definitely have the personalities. Um, I wish Miss Mocha Monster was more like Odo. Uh, she is not a lovey-dovey cat. You can pet her. Uh, she, loves, she loves being pet and her getting, getting her butt scratched and her chin scratched and stuff like that. It has to be her idea. You can't walk up to her and do it or she'll walk away. Now, she, can, she has to come up to you first, but you cannot pick her up and hold her. She will not allow you to do it. She's never been that way. And I don't know why that is. I'm, well, every... Just like it, just like people, I guess every cat's gonna have its own personality. But um, yeah, so we're we've had other cats that loved being being held. Our previous cat, Patches, um, would actually reach up from the floor to uh, to Robin, like put her paws on her on her thighs to, it, it, as as a way of saying, "Hey, pick me up." And she would do that all the time. Miss Mocha, we got her as a as a baby, and still she just does not want to be held. That's just just not her thing. We love her to death, but uh, she's not a lovey-dovey kitty. I think she takes after Dad that way. She takes after me because I'm not one that really likes being, being uh, you know, like touched, and I'm not. I'm sort of like sort of antisocial. So I wonder if maybe that's that's where she gets it. Maybe <laughs> maybe it's through osmosis. Uh, okay, this next one comes from uh, Donnie. Okay, hi Darren. My story goes back to something that took place in my house. Uh, excuse me, took place in the house my family lived in between my younger sister and myself in the early 1980s. I was between seven and nine at the time. My sister Jen was five or six. 
My father had recently passed away in the house, so maybe this had something to do with this. We were in my mother's bedroom, watching wrestling and occasionally doing our best version of a wrestler on the mother's bed on which we sat. Behind us was the uh, sack of, the, excuse me, behind us was the back, I gotta, hold on a second folks. I got, got a little fuzz in my eye here and I have a hard time seeing something, hold on a second. Also getting a drink while I'm at it. Okay, I think, I think that cleared up, okay. Um, okay, uh, where were we? Uh, we were in my mother's bedroom watching wrestling and occasionally doing our best version of a wrestler on my mother's bed on which we sat. My brother and I used to do that. We used to wrestle all the time on my parents' bed. We wrestled on our, oh, we wrestled on their um, water bed once. Whoo, boy, did we get our butts scor uh, scorched for that one. Look, okay, anyway, <laughs> moving on to your story. Um, behind us was the back of the room. There was a bookcase that my father built and a door next to it with steps right behind the door that went up to the attic. I kept noticing something moving behind us in the back of the room where the bookcase was. However, when I would look behind me, I wouldn't see anything, uh, so I'd go back to what, oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry folks. However, when I would look behind me, I wouldn't see anything, so I'd go back to watching TV. This happened at least a few times, and I would stare for a good little bit the last time or two because I knew I saw something. Finally, I know I see something moving behind us and turned my head quickly this time to catch what it was. I'm trying to make sense of what I'm seeing. There's this, what I can only describe as looking like a very miniature orange comet thing darting around. My sister is now looking too. All of a sudden it moves like a speeding missile and sounded like one too that shoots right between both of us and hits the television. The thing is moving really fast, going all around the television screen like it's desperately trying to get somewhere. I think it was trying to get into the television, but of course can't know for I can't know for sure. Anyway, I don't remember if it went in the TV or just disappeared, but I do remember clearly the TV just shut off. My sister and I stared at each other for a couple of seconds in disbelief, and I said, RUN! And we took off out of the room and downstairs. Later, my mother called us up to her room and asked us what we did to her TV, because it wouldn't even turn on. We didn't tell her what happened, and never talked about it again until a few years ago. The TV did eventually turn back on, many months later, but never worked right again. The picture was all blurry and messed up. I don't remember how it was brought up, but many years later my sister started describing a little of what had happened and describing the little comet-looking thing we saw, the sound it made, and the color of it. That really validated for me what had happened. I know we were so young that maybe we weren't remembering things as they really happened, or even misunderstood what we saw and there's a perfectly reasonable explanation. However, it was so strange, yet so clear to us. Uh, what happened that I can't even begin to find an explanation for it. Thanks for all the hard work, Darren, and providing a comfortable and safe space to tell our events like this. P.S. I'm way behind in episodes. Did you ever get to put together a Weird Darkness vacation package? Thanks again, Donnie. Wow, that, boy, that goes back. Uh, the vacation package never, never got around. I don't know what the deal was with that. There was somebody at one of these... Um, paranormal conventions that came up to me and asked me about the possibility of creating something like that and I gave gave her my information we talked a little bit about it while we were there and then nothing so I have no idea what uh, whatever happened with that I'm still up for the up for the idea if, if she ever calls in but no I don't think it's gonna happen um, I don't have anything on the calendar actually for for a weird darkness right now uh, the uh, the weirdo wagon the beast is in the garage just sitting there. <laughs> I don't have anything planned at all. Uh, I think you and your sister did see something, and the reason I say that is because I mean, if it was just your imagination, she wouldn't remember it exactly the same way you did. You both remember it exactly the same way. You remember the exact color, you remember the way it moved, its shape, uh, the sound it made. I, I, I think you probably did see something. I can't tell you what it was. I have no idea. 
Um, I'm sure somebody's going to say, it was ball lightning, and maybe it was. I, I never experienced ball lightning. I don't know. But that's the only thing that popped into my head while I was reading it. But thank you very much, Donnie. I really appreciate it. And don't worry about uh, catching up on all the episodes. Uh, I've been posting so many um, Dark Eye episodes recently just because of migraines and stuff like that, that uh, uh, you're, you're really not missing much. <laughs> I, sh I shouldn't say that about my own podcast, should I? Oh, well, too late now. Uh, okay, moving on. This one comes from uh, Deborah. Hello, Darren. Uh, last summer, my boyfriend and I went up to New Hampshire with another couple for the weekend. On Saturday night around 11 p.m., we decided to drive up to the Kankamugus Highway? Kankamagus Highway to a... Uh, whatever. The K Highway. Uh, to a lookout parking spot that we had passed by the day before to relax and look at the stars. Since it was such a clear night, we figured it'd be beautiful without any ambient light, and it was. We each put down a blanket and laid down. After about half an hour, I noticed two bright stars above and to my right, diagonal to each other, that I had not noticed a minute ago. At the exact same time, my boyfriend sat up and said, Where did those two stars come from? For the next couple of minutes, we excitedly commented back and forth about how they definitely were not there until just now. All of a sudden, they got super bright, and then they both started moving. They started out slow, and then got faster, staying in the same formation until they got so far away that we could no longer see them. We were freaking out and yelling, did you see that, to our friends who were both sleeping. Eventually, we drove back to the cabin, but talked about it all night until we finally went to sleep. The next morning, as I was getting dressed, I noticed two diagonal red dots on my left wrist that I didn't believe were there before. I ran to my boyfriend to show him and to tell him to check his. He took off his watch, and he had the, the exact same marks. Wow. We were screaming and joking about how we probably got abducted. I know it was a crazy coincidence that we both had those marks, but what we saw the night before was real whatever that was. Thank you so much for all that you do, and keep up the good work. God bless your sister in Christ. Deborah. That is freaky, Deborah. Oh my gosh. If it's just, if it's just the stars, if, 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 if all you're doing is looking into the sky, and you see a couple of white lights, and they get really bright, and they slowly move in formation, and they just move further away and further away, you could almost say, okay, well maybe that was a hovercraft or something, or not a hovercraft, but a a, uh, a glider or um, a couple of drones, even though this was a long time ago, but um, maybe it was just the, the edges of, of a plane of plane wings, and it's just it was at that precise angle where it was moving away. So it looked like two stars um, slowly moving away. But when you, when you wake up and you get the two dots on your wrist that are in the, I, I you don't say it, but I'm assuming the two dots were in that same diagonal pattern. I think. Did you say that? Or, 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 um, red dots on my left wrist. I did. Yo, there, you did say it. Okay, you noticed two diagonal red dots on the left wrist. Okay, so they were in that diagonal pattern. But for that to happen to you, and then for you to run to your boyfriend and him to have the same thing, that is a close encounter of the third kind kind of situation. You know, where, where Richard Dreyfus gets the burn on one side of his face after he sees something. That's, that's what happened to you guys. Uh, the, uh, that is really, really cool. Um, it, uh, if you if, if you had thought about it, you, you could have taken a photo of those diagonal diagonals on your wrists. People would, of course, try to explain it away, but at least you'd have the evidence so you could look back on it. Um, okay, this one comes from uh, Ellie. She says, I was just listening to your Alcatraz stories on Weird Darkness. I had to stop for a moment to send you this memory I have of that place. So here it is. For about 38 years, I lived an hour away from Alcatraz. If the only time I went there was when I lived in Oregon more than 45 years ago. I went with friends to see that old prison. Everything was going great until we went to the solitary confinement cells. They stuffed many of us in one of those darkened cells and shut the door. In the absolute darkness, I felt someone behind me. I, I could have sworn I heard him breathing, and he even reached out and touched my back. The lights came back on when they opened the door, and I realized no one was behind me. I had been the first one in, which put me all the way in the back of that cell. I had to wonder if one of Casper's larcenous cousins had just tapped me in the shoulder to, stay, to uh, say howdy. 
Well, that's all for now. I never did go back. I have to wonder if any other visitors on that tour have had similar experiences. Now, back to Weird Darkness. Keep up the good work. I love listening to them as I work out at the neighborhood gym. Thank you, signed Ellie. Thank you, Ellie. I, I appreciate that. I, I, yeah, Alcatraz is, is so, so haunted. Um, I, I love the movie The Rock with Sean Connery and Nick, and, uh, Nick Cage. And there's that scene where the, the, the guide, I guess for lack of better words, puts all the people in, in, in a cell and closes it and kind of says, well, you know, it's really, really scary in there, isn't it? I didn't realize they actually did that for people. So you went there and they actually put you in one of the cells. And not just the open cell like, like in the movie, but in the, in the solitary confinement cells where it would be, what, complete, complete darkness, right? It'd be, you'd be completely black in there. That would, even without the, uh, the breathing and the feeling uh, something touch your back, even without that, it would still be horrifying being in that cell in the complete darkness. I cannot imagine going to prison, any prison, Alcatraz or anything else, but, but being in solitary confinement like that, where there's no light at all, just there alone with your own thoughts and nothing else, you would slowly go mad. Um, I, I understand it as a, as a temporary uh, punishment, uh, you know, as, as a deterrent for, for misbehaving in the prison. But then, there's, boy, there's, there's got to be, there's a certain point, though, at, that they, you, you would just go crazy. Um, I, I would be talking to myself probably within the first couple of hours. Just, just to hear something, anything. Uh, all right, now, moving on. Uh, ooh, this is a long one. Let me, let me get a, a sip of a drink here before we get into this one. Okay. Let's see if uh, if he or she wants me to keep them. Oh, this is Ken. A Ken De Silva. Awesome. Ken De Silva Hill has uh, sent us things in the past. He's from Kent, and he's he sends things quite a bit. Uh, and you know, so I've shared a lot of his stories in the podcast, not not in Fireside Frights, but just in regular episodes. Uh, he's a professional writer. Okay, so. Uh, let's not go there. Uh, sometimes one finds a place which looks fine and settles down there, for better or for worse. Sometimes it's for worse, but we live with it. We bought the house as a wreck, primarily because it was cheap and we're both practical people. When we viewed it, it had been on the market for three years at a price of X. Well, let's not say, but at that price, it was much too much in view of the work involved in order to improve it and to make it livable in the 21st century so that we could really get down to doing our respective work. We wandered around the house anyway, as we had come some distance to view it, and we were taken by its possibilities if fully restored. But the price was the stumbling block to making an offer, certainly in view of the erect condition inside and out. The house had been neglected for 40 years. The vendor, a lady of late middle age, had lived there since childhood and was now cramped by having her adult children living with her, along with their kids. She took little interest in us looking around. She had apparently done the same thing many times since the house had been first put up for sale. She had more. Uh, she was more interested in the large TV in the dilapidated lounge that she was in, or than she was in us. On our way out, she asked if we were interested in buying, and I jokingly said that we would offer X, less than half the asking price, and pay cash, real money, immediately, if she wanted a quick sale. She closed the door, abruptly, and that was the end of that. We went for coffee at the local cafe before starting our long journey home, and we were taken by the friendliness of the locals. It seemed a nice area to live in, but obviously it was not for us. We drove over towards the motorway, through narrow, rural lanes, but even before we had arrived at the slip road, the phone started ringing. It was the owner of the house, accepting my paltry and joking offer. We told her we would think uh, a little and get back to her in the morning, and then discussed the ins and outs as we drove back home. We decided it was an opportunity too good to miss. Well, the sale went through quickly, as we stipulated that as paying cash, we wanted to be in the house within the month, and, give or take a few days, an extra couple of thousand which she squeezed out of us various odds and ends around the garden and garage we were, or more correctly, I was. 
As soon as I was reasonably settled, camping alone with an inflatable mattress and sleeping bag on the top floor. <laughs> uh, side note here, that's actually what happened when, I, when we moved from uh, Independence, Missouri to Rockford, Illinois. When I took a radio job, we came to an apartment, no furniture. I actually brought a sleeping bag and a, and a, and a blow-up mattress, and I, and I lived that way for a week until Robin got up here. Okay, anyway, moving on. Um, as soon as I was recent, reasonably settled, camping alone with an inflatable mattress and sleeping bag on the top floor, I started work. The place was in a really terrible state, a really a real mess in the areas not available at a quick glance. My partner had disappeared abroad for a few weeks. I was on my own, well, just me and the dog. There was no cooker, so I pinched the one from my boat to use as an emergency effort, one pot cooking being a specialty of mine when sailing single-handedly. Just simply chuck the whole lot in the pot to cook, and a few minutes later, eat the resulting mess. Usually delicious, and the boat still on course with the hem roped up, with the helm roped up. As an aside here, if you sail and cruise, do not forget to use a sharpie to mark what is in, what is in your food tins. The paper labels have a habit of falling off uh, tin cans when at sea for a period, the air usually being damp, leading to interesting meal combinations like baked beans, soup, and pineapple rings. Waste not, what not. Now back to the story. Both my partner and I would need an office each, so that we could quickly get back to work, so this was where I started. I chose the top floor for my office. It was a decent-sized room next to my new temporary campsite, and had a walk-in cupboard, which extended into the roof space. Plenty of space for my junk, and a window overlooking a rural view beyond. I spent a lot of time gazing out the windows, waiting for inspiration to strike. Anyway, we were in and making a start. Over the next few days, I met a few of the locals, who seemed surprised that the house had actually sold, and so suddenly, too. I had found five or six different estate agents had left for sale signs stashed behind the garage, which told the tale of a long period of non-sales and many potential buyers being put off by the state of the place. Apparently, the house had a history, though nobody was keen to tell us what it was, and we still do not know everything to this day, as those who probably could tell the tale were elderly then and are certainly dead now, over 15 years later. But I'm rambling, so let's get down to the real nitty-gritty. The house has an aura. Not a smell, but certainly a strange mix of shadow and strangeness, though now we are quite used to it, and rarely even consider it. But our visitors often make some comment about shade, moving shadows, or sudden cold, or even the odd, strange sound. Actually, the house is bright, and in my view, welcoming, my partner's office being the most lavish room in the house, though once, and maybe now too, the center of unusual attention. This ground floor room was damp, the chimney blocked, and three carpets were laid on top of uh, one another on the floor, almost two inches having been cut from the bottom of the door to cope with the thickness of the three rugs. Too mean to take them to the dump, I guess. I was later, uh, I was later working in this room when, as I stooped to remove a floorboard, I was roughly poked in the center of my back from behind. Even now, I still shiver a little as I write this. It felt very much as though a finger had been jerked into my spine, to the degree that it really hurt. Temporarily, I just could not move at all. It was like a weird paralysis for a few seconds. And then the key dropped from the lock of the door, clattering upon the bare boards and spinning around, seemingly pushed by a hidden force. The very next moment, the doorbell rang, and there was a firm rap upon the window, quite startling in the circumstances. The postman had arrived to deliver a package. We chatted for a minute or two while I signed his form, and mysteriously my previous recent experience went out of my thoughts. The postman asked whether he might use our toilet, and as I had a flask of tea handy, he had a drink and a look around before he left. It's always useful to be on good terms with the postman. Always a localized front, uh, always a localized front of all knowledge and gossip, in my view. Returning to work, I noticed that my hammer, which had been on a shelf, was now on the floor. And then I thought back. Perhaps that falling hammer had hit me in the back as I stooped down, the vibrations shaking the key from the lock. Yes, a very likely explanation. 
I unblocked the fireplace after removing the defunct and ancient gas-burning heater, knocking the old mortared bricks out, only to find the space behind filled with rubble and rubbish. I cleared this away, along with fourteen bird skeletons, crows who had entered the chimney and then not been able to escape again. We now have a wood-burning stove here, so no more falling crows. There were bones under the floorboards, too, maybe a fox or a dog. I could not tell, and frankly did not want to know. At night, the house is curiously different in feeling, and like all old houses, generates creaks and squeaks here and there as the temperature and humidity change with night and day. We had a clock, a modern radio-controlled type, always absolutely right, and being battery-driven is quite silent. But still, we hear a chime from time to time, echoing quietly between the walls, and on really quiet nights in summer, the gentle but continuous and distinct tick-tick-tock of a phantom clock can sometimes be sensed. One night after an intensive day of plastering, I awoke to an overwhelming smell of perfume, somewhat familiar but also quite strange, seemingly hanging in the air. Its aroma invoked a faint memory of childhood, but I'd been working hard and soon uh, drowsed off again, as soon drowsed off again, as though it had been a dream infused with memory of the plaster work performed earlier down on the mysterious ground floor. Next morning, I entered the bathroom, a large room at the back of the first floor and more suitable for a double bedroom but really just containing an old stained bath, roughly plumbed in and absolutely nothing more. A room with a bath to discover the stained and moldy carpet strewn with a thick covering of white powder and smelly like, as my neighbor later suggested, a tarts boudoir. The powder turned out to be scented talc, or baby powder. There was none in the house. We never use it, but it was this smell which had inspired in me the old memory of being a small child. I cleared the mess away by the simple expedience of cutting up the filthy carpet and disposing of the whole lot, enameled iron bath included. This I smashed to pieces with a club hammer just to get it out easily. I should have saved it. Our local salvage place flogs them for around 500 pounds. The room is still a bathroom, a complete one, but now with a heated marble floor, gilded mirrors, and a chandelier, a place of luxury and relaxation. But now my curiosity was on fire, and I changed the weak and feeble locks upon the front and back doors in case a forgotten key had been used by an intruder who was playing some sort of foolish prank on me whilst I slept on the upper floor. The kitchen was my next project. And the old servant's entrance, having been bricked up in past times, I opened up the upper section and installed a double-glazed leaded window in a style that suited the mid-Victorian house. This brightened up the kitchen area considerably, and a few days later I knocked out the ancient sink and plumbing. I later made a few quid on the lead piping as scrap metal. It was while I was bagging rubble from this that the light in the room suddenly changed, and looking up to the new window as a, re as a reflex action, I had the fleeting impression of a shadowy figure in a large hat having just passed by. I rushed to the front door, but both the gated access to the side of the house and the street were empty. To this day, a figure often passes the window, never ever recorded on our security cameras, but very fleetingly caught by eye alone. We have seen it frequently, as have our guests and friends. We call it Clara, but it might equally be Claude. It happens so suddenly we never get a good look. I collect various things an old obsession, and the room up on top in which I camped for weeks is now a music room, full of my mandolins, guitars, and other instruments. Among these is an early Viennese zither, a multi-string instrument usually played laid on a table, either plucked by fingertip plectrums or lightly hammered with two short shafts of wood. The other instruments are hung around the walls, some used regularly, though some are just too old or valuable to be handled often. We often hear music from this room, and particularly when we're listening from my office, which is located next door. I used to put this down to drafts, as the wind works on an 
alien harp, or flies maybe, lightly brushing the strings with their wings as they settled momentarily, or buzzed past too close, but then a quiet but simple melody often started to be heard. Now and again, and very briefly, and in some way hauntingly pleasant, the gentle sound of the old antique zither. However, the zither is kept boxed in its original case, and is rarely removed for use. And anyway, a yellow duster lays across the instrument in its case, which protects the new strings from tarnish, another full set being too expensive to replace, and thus the duster would muffle the strings from making any sound. It seems that our now lovely, complete, uh, completely restored and modern Victorian home is haunted. But I can live with this. Let's not go there. A neighbor told us that, according to his elderly mother, the house was once full of fun and joy back in the 1920s, when young folk and children used to visit to uh, take dancing lessons from the then owner, a young, single, continental lady, apparently French, a Miss Daoth, it seems. We have one of her visiting cards found beneath the floorboards in the main room of the house, the room still to this day fitted with a floor-to-ceiling mirror, in, which, in front of which is where apparently she taught young girls ballet and young men to waltz or tango. She also had a dark side, apparently, but I've already covered that story elsewhere in The Outside Lock. The attic may have a few secrets, too, but I've barely started up there, dusty, dark, and twisty. It seems to be inhabited by something, maybe squirrels, mice, or other scrambling beasts, and sometimes what sounds like shuffling footsteps may only be birds who nest there from time to time, but these noises are now just background noises in the night to us. We ignore them. We're not troubled by our ghosts, if indeed that is what they are. We live among them and accept the strange and weird occurrences, the books removed from shelves and strewn open on the sofa, the keys that find their own way to other doors than the ones they fit, the close watching of our dogs as something or someone completely invisible to us makes its way across the room, the chandeliers swinging slightly and casting shadows from their arms, the lights often switched off suddenly at the stroke of ten at night and then flickering back on once again, or the occasional plate smashed noisily on the kitchen floor by an unseen hand. It is a happy house, now finished in the main, the ninth most expensive in the village, and even as I write this, sitting quite alone, I can hear a faint rustle beyond the door, as if heavy silk is being brushed gently along the landing wall outside. There's no point in opening the door to look. The landing will be empty. Maybe Miss Daoth lightly, or maybe Miss Daoth is walking in our house or silently watching us, perhaps remembering her house in life, the satin of her dress lightly heard as she moves invisibly about. I wish her well. We live together in perfect harmony, the ghost and I, and in relative peace we are both owners of a place to enjoy, me in life and in her case death. Maybe I will join her soon, in living here in eternity too. I'm really looking forward to haunting my partner, and also others to come. Story 2 The Outside Bolt when I look back, I wonder what enticed us to buy the house. Outwardly, it was just right for our family, in a pleasant and quiet village setting and structurally sound, although very neglected both inside and out. The photo on the agent's card indicated a gabled and tile-hung red brick country house of mid-19th century style with bay window and overhang style porch, and having a manageable front garden bounded by a spiked wrought iron railing and gate. The family who had lived there before had done little or no work on the exterior during their 40-year tenure, and absolutely nothing on the interior, apart from painting the walls and floorboards in a half-hearted and scrappy manner. Their children had apparently all grown up in the house and had seemingly stayed on well into adulthood, not an unusual thing in the 60s and 70s, as a serious housing short, as a serious housing short, let me try that again. Uh, as a serious housing shortage in England was endemic following the bombing during the Second World War. In large towns, it was even more difficult to find an affordable home as folk gravitated from the villages to the towns, seeking better employment than the hard and poor paying agriculture work in the country. In London and other large towns, house building was slow to begin as massive clearance of war damage was the priority before work could start 
In council housing estates and high-risk blocks of flats took priority over private housing to accommodate those made homeless and displaced by the war. We, though, saw the countryside as a new start away from the increasing pollution, petty crime and rush and crush of London, buying a house which, though in very bad state, did have potential for real improvement into a large family home. We would work to give it new life and to improve it to be worthy of a 20th century family going forward to a better way of living. As a restorer, I saw it as a challenge to bring it back to life. Our first few months in the house were more like a camping expedition than being at home, as there was no real bathroom, just a tiny cold WC and all the ground floor rooms being riddled with serious damp. The house is Victorian and had originally been built with no facilities of any kind. The WC was in the garden, alongside a small brick log store for, fi uh, for firewood, both places filthy and dilapidated to the extent of having been unused for years. The stairs to the upper floors, steep and narrow, made their twisted way to the spacious top floor, which was where we made our temporary home as we started to restore. The lighting in the house was sparse and dim as electricity had only been laid on in the early 1930s, so the wiring in the house was very basic, and mains water and gas supplies had only come a few years before then, when a new road was driven through the, uh, through the village, bringing these basic services with it. Previously, the house had been lit with candles and oil lamps, and water had been taken from a well with a hand pump outside. I made a start on the restoration on the ground floor tackling the problem of the damp by digging a trench around the outside walls to once again expose the damp proof course and to dry the brickwork inside and out. At the back of the house, the garden had actually encroached through the brickwork to the extent that a large bush was growing right through the wall next to the kitchen, its thick, gnarled trunk pushing the brickwork out of place and causing the small, broken window to sag to the right. The place was a complete mess. But in my eyes, the house really had potential, and especially the low price we had bought it for. As a Victorian house, the building does have some quite interesting and desirable features, however, as for example, all the original cast iron fire surrounds and grates remain in place, and the main reception room features a very large and imposing gilt-framed mirror to one wall. The mirror is almost floor to ceiling and reaches across the wall from door to door, apparently once having had a support bar, as used by ballet dancers across its face. The original fixings for this handrail still survive. The first floor opens off of a narrow landing from the stairs, which rise up from the hall. There are four rooms on this floor. At the front, and looking out over the village, crossroads and a large bedroom with a small closet room adjacent to it. This little closet will become an ensuite shower and bathroom in time as we get on with the work. At the very back of this floor was another double bedroom which has two narrow windows, although we have now modified this into a sumptuous and large traditionally styled Victorian bathroom, something the house was sadly lacking when we moved in. It now looks splendid, with the modern luxury features of a heated marble floor marble-lined shower, and an old-fashioned stand-alone roll-top bath and matching, ba uh, matching wash basin. The finishing touch here was to add a glass chandelier and styling dressing mirror. The fourth room is somewhat smaller, but is also a double. Originally a gloomy and claustrophobic chamber, its window opens onto a plain brick wall on one side and has a very restricted view over the rear garden. The original room had just a built-in wardrobe and small open fireplace with a simple pine mantle, but we've now transformed it to be bright and airy and decorated in a light and colorful scheme. But it was not always like this. We call it the Room of Dreams. On first moving into the house, we used this back room as a storage place for boxes or family stuff, our large book collection, and all of the bits and bobs we did not immediately need. It was packed with boxes, bags, and wooden crates from floor to ceiling. We shrouded everything with dust sheets to protect our belongings from the dust of the crumbling lath, uh, lathe and plaster of the walls and ceiling which seemed to rot away even as we looked at it. We had a lot to do elsewhere, so the room was very rarely entered as we began the hard work of restoration in the rest of the house. The family we had purchased the house from had left. The heavy sealed ba uh, excuse me. 
uh, the family we had purchased the house from had left a heavy sealed bag with the estate agent for us. This bag contained every key for every lock throughout the house. Doors, cupboards, gates, garage, and garden store. The locks are all original, good, antique Victorian metalwork at its best, and the large keys are all original to these locks, which in the main are of solid iron and brass, through bolted, uh, through bolted to the doors in the traditional and old-fashioned manner. The door to the storage room was somewhat different from the others in that although the outward design is exactly the same, the door is substantially much more solidly built and of considerably thicker wood, too. The frame is set slightly askew in the wall, excuse me, uh, the frame is sli slightly askance in the wall, but the door has been constructed to fit exactly with a close fit to the, re to the uh, rebate of the ar architrave. He, he, thanks for using words that I can't pronounce, Ken. <laughs> Let me try that again. With a close fit to the rebate of the architrave. The lock, too, is very substantial and has a unique key, a key which will only operate this particular lock, although the other door locks in the house are able to be opened with various, uh, various of the room keys, albeit some with a little trouble. Near the top of this door, but on the outside of the room, was a thick iron hasp held by four screws, and the door could be secured with a, with a, a strong brass hook from the door frame into this. A foot below this, a heavy locking slide bolt was fitted to the door style, sliding into a steel tube set into the wood of the door frame. Along with the lock, bolt, and hook, and hasp, it seemed that the door was intended to stay firmly locked and closed from the outside. I do not know if my wife or son ever gave much thought to this, but I certainly did. It occurred to me that only an adult would be able to reach the hook or bolt and the hook itself was an extra assurance if the bolt was slid back and forgotten at any time. Above the door, a nail had been driven into the wall, and a deep crescent of worn plaster below indicated to me that the brass key to the bolt, shorter than the main iron lock key, had been hung there during its many years of use. In fact, it had hung there long enough for the key itself to have worn smooth at the nose or bit end whilst the bow had similar wear from hanging on the iron nail. It had probably hung there for over a hundred years, I thought. We continued with the restoration work, and within a year or two, the ground floor was transformed. Our house was beginning to look like a home. I'd installed new oak floors, replastered the walls and ceilings, extended the rear of the house to give a larger kitchen and dining room, and had even incorporated the old dilapidated outhouses into the main structure of the house, having removed the inside bush and other vegetation. Refurbished, these two rooms, although not large, made an excellent utility-slash-meditation room and a warm, pleasant separate loo for the extended kitchen area. As we finished each room and decorated, we brought our beloved items down from the storage room to furnish and decorate them. I built a large break-front bookcase to divide two of the ground-floor rooms, and this was soon filled with our favorite books and was nicely set off with the trinkets and curios which our family had collected on our travels. The new kitchen was fitted out with the unused pots, pans, and equipment from storage, and the gloomy room upstairs was becoming emptier every week. Friends, soon, uh, soon to be visiting England from abroad, made it important to get more bedrooms ready for use, so we cleared the remaining jumble and boxes from the room down to the garage as a temporary resort and made a good start on the first upstairs floor. The front bedroom was in generally good condition and only needed a plaster skim to the walls and ceiling before painting and fitting out, although we also took the opportunity to rewire the electrics, renew the pipes under the floorboards, and put in radiators and a blind. Job done. A new purpose made bed, glass chandelier, interesting artwork, and attractive curtains and color scheme made it a welcoming room, the finishing touch being a splendid padded tapestry, headboard to the bed, handmade by my wife, with pretty antique gilded angels with outspread wings as the corner supports. After having a well-earned rest from working for a week, I next made a start on the now empty and sad, gloomy storage room. I had not realized what a terrible state it was in, as I had filled it with our storage boxes and junk, or indeed as I emptied it. Now that it was cleared, and at long last had a fresh bright light bulb and newly cleaned window glass, it looked a complete wreck. 
I had known before that the plaster was in a bad state, but now, as I looked, it seemed to have deliberately scored, scratched, and damaged. In fact, in some places it was grooved down to the wooden lathes under the plaster, and the ceiling seemed to have been hit about with heavy objects being thrown at it. The floor was in a similar state when I removed the filthy dark red paisley carpet. The floorboards were gouged and worn, the wood cracked, splintered, and stained with years of dark liquid of some type soaked into it. Unusually, the boards had been screwed down rather than nailed, many of the old and rusted slot had iron screws being damaged or exposed by the wood having been dug away around them. The small black fireplace, with its cast iron insert, was in good condition, but the stone hearth was cracked and broken. The chimney itself was blocked with old bricks and other debris behind the iron inert, or behind the, the iron insert, indicating that the fire had not been used for many years. Another strange feature was that four strong steel plates had been screwed to the floor in a rectangle in the middle of the room. I had discovered these when the ugly old carpet and old newspapers used for underlay were removed. This rectangle was approximately six feet long by three feet wide, with the long sides running along the length of the room. Each plate had a short, hinged bar welded to it, which folded flat to the floor, and each bar had two offset screw holes. Neatly fitted into the floor, within this rectangle was a small metal flap door, hinged to lay flat to the boards and, with its own Brahma-type lock, the only key which we did not have. Now, Brahma locks are virtually unpickable, very secure and a Victorian invention still made and used for high security purposes today, so suspecting that this might be the door to some kind of safe, strong box or hiding place, I managed to break open the flap after a lot of work with a cold chisel and hammer, only to find it concealed just a simple pair of brass screw terminals alongside a strange electrical device with a big copper coil and a dried-out glass le, uh, le, le cloche battery, I'll just say battery, or dried-out glass low battery. Why was a piece of Victorian electrical equipment locked into a strong box on the floor between the joists, I wondered? Still. It might be worth selling at auction, as an antique, I thought, and made a mental note to get someone in to look at it. Beginning early next morning, I started to assess how much work there was to be done in the room. The built-in wardrobe was in generally good condition inside, although, like the rest of the room, the outside of the door and its frame was in a bit of state, also being heavily gouged and scratched from top to bottom. I decided to replace it completely and proceeded to remove the door and take apart the frame. The cloud of dust and plaster released as I pulled the frame away from the wall filled the room, and wishing it not go further into the house, I tried to lift the sash window to allow it to disperse. The sash would only open an inch or so before becoming stuck fast, so the room was left for the dust to settle before making another attempt. After having coffee and making a couple of amendments to a script I was writing, I returned to the room and on closely inspecting the window, discovered that the upper and lower sashes had been stopped from opening any more than an inch or so by hard wooden blocks screwed into the sash boxes, where the weights hung on their cords. Once these blocks were removed, the window opened fully, but only after removing the thick, clogged paint that had been applied over many years from the runners. Hoovering up the dust, I once again turned my attention to the wardrobe, now just hanging with its ripped wallpaper and curtains of cobwebs after the frame had been removed. Something unusual caught my eye. The back panel of the wardrobe was papered with an old-fashioned floral print, but it seemed as though a raised strip of something was set under the paper across the back wall. Removing the paper, I discovered that the back panel of the wardrobe was hinged about 30 inches from the floor. This was cleverly concealed by the wallpaper inside, and very difficult to see when the door and frame had been in place. Now it was apparent that the back panel could be folded down out of the door, and thus had formed some sort of narrow table. On removing the door, I'd noticed a wooden ledge screwed onto the inside, and now realized that this had once been used as a side support for the table when the door was open. Behind the table, in the wall, was a shallow space with three shelves and as I lowered the table down fully, I had a sudden shock. It seemed that the lower shelf 
was full of wriggling brown snakes falling out on me through the dust. I slammed the panel shut, realizing immediately as I did so that these could not really be snakes. There had been no movement at all on the shelf or any noise behind the table, and besides, the covering of dust had been undisturbed until I lowered the table. Slowly dropping the panel again, I saw, through the gloom and now rising dust cloud, that what I had thought were snakes were in fact a number of ancient, worn and perished brown rubber tubes, stiff in places and thick with dust. A mouse nest was in the corner of the shelf, and strewn around was the shredded wool of an old red blanket which had been nibbled apart, laying alongside a disgustingly dirty and perished hot water bottle. The smell of aged decay spread out into the room as I slowly took in these items. The upper shelves held jugs, antique medicine bottles of various shapes and colors, bits of rusty wire, several knitting and crochet needles, and an old rusted medical scalpel and scissors. Packs of tissues covered bandage and cotton wool were stacked near the base. Alongside a strong and long wide leather belt, the brass buckle now green and aged with uh, vertigris. A small medical handbook, its covers dirty, foxed, and stained, was wrapped in a filthy canvas, striped, striped apron of the type that butchers once used, and a corner of an old envelope peeped out from between its foxed and discolored pages. A pair of rusted old-fashioned police handcuffs hang from a, from a small hook, and a large glass syringe rolled slowly back and forth with the disturbance. Bringing in a cardboard box, I just dropped these items in it, off the shelves, pushed the box into a clear space, and continued to clean out the corner of the room where the cupboard had been. I now wish that I had thought at the time to take a photograph. It was getting late in the afternoon, and the setting sun had now left the room dark and chilly, so I finished work for the day, looking forward to a comfy weekend with the family and maybe even a nice trip out to the nearby coast for a day of beach fun and fish and chips. With our guests now expected to arrive in just ten days' time, on the Monday morning I made a fresh start, clearing away the dust, plaster and dirt from the floor, and stripping what was left of the shabby wallpaper. The frame, door and table from the cupboard, went into our recycling skip, the rest into the rubbish bin. The cardboard box I put into the garage for later investigation, just in case anything might be of historical interest. Well, in short, the plasterers came and did a great job of the walls and ceiling. I sorted out the sash window with new double-glazed units and removed the bolt and other hardware from outside the door, and went hell for leather at it, painting and decorating the room as soon as the new plaster had dried sufficiently. We now came up with a plan, bought a new bed, carpet, and other furniture, and very soon had a beautiful bedroom ready for our guests. Just the smell of fresh paint and the glow of the newly furnished room was a delight to both of us. Hopefully our guests would enjoy it too. The ancient electrical instrument which had been removed from under the floor now found its way into my office for further research, when, of course, I could find the spare time to actually do so. Two weeks passed pleasantly, with the family introducing our newly arrived friends to the locality, enjoying the old pubs, beautiful beaches, and many interesting historical places nearby so much so that the curiosities of the room slipped from my mind. However, our guests had had some sleepless nights and many weird dreams during their stay, but we did not hear of this till much later. Whilst I was being busy with the house and restorations, my wife had been out and about around the village, getting to know the local shops and weekly market. Of course, in a small country village, a new face soon becomes noticed, and within a month my wife had been introduced to many local people. An elderly lady had asked her where we were living in the village, and when my wife told her which house, she asked if we still had the large mirror. I used to practice ballet at that mirror, said the lady, but of course that would have been in the early 1920s, well before the last war. I was only four when I started to dance. Within a short time, my wife had heard the full story of the lady's dancing career, which she had started in our house. She'd gone on to be a successful dancer both in England and on the continent, only stopping at the outbreak of World War II when she had joined the RAF as a radio operator and plotter. She now lived alone in her small cottage, along with her memories and photographs. Of course, she was invited to come for coffee and to see again the old mirror that she had trained in front of, and in due course, there we were, sitting at the table and chatting like old friends. 
Mildred, for that was her name, had many stories of the village events, and even at her great age she had very good recall. We were told that our house had belonged to a Mrs. De Off, who ran, uh, um, who ran what she called a dance academy from the house, largely teaching the younger girls and boys in the village the niceties of ballet and ballroom dancing, a social grace of some importance at that period in the early century. According to Mildred, Mrs. De Auth had come to live in the village around the 1880s, at which time, we guessed, she would have been about 25 years old, as Mildred told us that she was around 40 when uh, she knew her, and she apparently had later died in London during the Blitz in the 1940s. She was a strange lady in some ways, said Mildred. She kept to herself, made few local friends, but obviously had some money, as she wore beautiful and fashionable clothes and often traveled. Young women would come to stay with her for a few days now and then, but we rarely saw them about the village. We thought that they may have been her former pupils or students, as she was reputed to have been a well-known stage dancer and choreographer before she came here. My mother thought her rather common, though, a music hall type, she called her. Mildred sipped her coffee, dunked a biscuit, and carried on. Her husband was a strange man, too. We hardly saw him in the village. He was tall, well-spoken, and very well-dressed, but would have nothing to do with anybody around here. A bit of a mystery, really, but of course it takes all sorts to make the world go around. At this point we slipped back into local small talk, but my curiosity was aroused. We tried to find out more, of course, but few of the older folk in the village either had known, or now maybe did not even want to talk, about Mrs. Dioff and her dancing academy. We found a clue later, though. The top floor of the house, although also very dilapidated, had huge potential for installing a master bedroom as a self-contained suite at the front. If I was to give up the clutter of my office up there, it could actually become a medium-sized but well-presented separate apartment, we thought. I'd taken over the top floor back room as soon as we moved in. As an office, it enjoyed a nice view, and also made a great escape place for me to write and paint in, away from my casual interruptions. A gable to the front of the main a gable, that is, to the front of the main room big enough for us to use as a walk-in wardrobe, is balanced on one side of the room by a three-pane dormer window on the other, with a beautiful outlook over the rear garden and countryside. With a south-facing view and the, clerk dark and the clear, dark night skies that we enjoy, I currently use it as an observatory for my telescopes and as an art studio during the day. So I set to work, designing the room to be something special for us both to enjoy, spacious, elegant, warm, and airy. It was whilst removing some skirting that I found the old visiting card. Neatly printed on fine cream-laid board in a scrolling script of gold embossed letters was the, leg was the legend Mrs. A. D'Anth, Qualified Dance Instruction and Other Services. Under this was an address, though not ours, in the village, and an old four-figure telephone number, which we later discovered to have once been on a West London exchange. The card had obviously slipped down behind the broken skirting from the windowsill and was still in excellent condition, although around 80 or 90 years old. I slipped it into my wallet and carried on with the work. Buying a dilapidated wreck is fun, like starting a painting on a fresh canvas with clean brushes and unopened tubes of paint. You become the artist and are able to create your ideal home. With the cash saved by burying the house cheaply, uh, by buying the house cheaply, one can invest in having what you really want, rather than having to go with the mundane ideas of builders or previous owners. In fact, you can expand your mind into your home. Our guests had now returned from their personal travels about the UK and were preparing to start packing up to return home. We took them out for drinks to a local host, uh, hostelry, host, that's a new word for me, hostelry, um, and in the course of conversation they asked us about the house. We gave them the rundown on what we'd achieved in the couple of years since moving in. They were particularly interested in their room and admired the decoration and pictures and commented on the comfortable bed. A funny thing, though, said Paul, is that although we have both slept well, we have both had disturbing dreams. It seems that these dreams, largely forgotten soon after waking, were of strange and sometimes terrifying content. 
People screaming, clinking noises, and a feeling of confinement and fear have often been a part of my dreams, but Lucy had been more affected than me, he continued. Lucy had actually been frightened by her dreams and had woken up crying with fear on several occasions, feeling that she had been harmed in some way. Paul told me this privately. Lucy would not talk about her experiences to me. She did talk to my wife, though, and confessed that she had had the feeling of being constrained, violated, and left alone in these awful dreams. It was as if I was tied down, drugged somehow and molested, but aware at the same time that I had agreed to this. Often a face was close to mine, staring at me and holding something over my mouth as I lay looking towards the ceiling. I felt terribly cold, without love or care, and desperately alone. She'd rather not talk about it said my wife, who then told me not to mention the matter to our guests again. Let's make their last days here really happy. And so we did, the dreams not mentioned again. It was a week or two after that they left that an old friend came to call. We went up a, uh, let me try that again. <clears throat> it was a week or two after they left that an old friend came to call. We went up to my office, which he calls the toy shop, to chat and have coffee. Now, I like junk. As an artist, everything has potential, and so my office is crowded with both useful and useless stuff, exactly the stuff that Jim also enjoys. He particularly liked the look of the old electrical device and poked around with it, cleaning the contacts and checking the wires. You know what I think this is, he said. I think what you have here is an old induction coil, probably a quack medicine device from the old days. Of course, I told him about where I found it, and he was intrigued, so much so that he asked if he could try to make it work. The principle is simple, he explained. This coil's actually two coils wound together. Putting an electrical current into one induces a current into the other, usually smaller or larger according to how it was, according to how it was wound. He went on to tell me that this type of device was used for giving electric shocks, supposed at the time to be beneficial to the patient or to stun pain away, although personally I have my doubts. Now full of enthusiasm for this new antique toy, Jim suggested that we try it out. You're not giving me any shocks, I told him. Nevertheless, my curiosity got the better of me, and like a couple of kids with a new toy, we got to work. The La, the La Sanche cell was a no-no ancient dried up and needing ass Um, okay, the, the, the La Sanche uh, was a no-no, ancient, dried up, and needing acid before it could be charged and used, but Jim had a plan. The battery for my portable drill was put into service as the power source, connected in an ad hoc manner using some lightning flex. At last, Jim threw the brass leaf switch and the room was suddenly brightened by the gold and blue flash of our four-inch spark flying between the brass terminals, along with the acidic smell of ozone. It was like a moment from a Frankenstein movie. Anyone who had a model railway as a child would recognize this strange electrical stench immediately. Of course, when our eyes cleared, we did not leave it there and continued our experiments with the glee of five-year-olds, completely oblivious of the dangers. We tried this and that, producing bigger and better sparks, both now wearing sunglasses with Jim looking particularly mad in my wife's yellow frames. Within an hour, the battery was flat. Both of us had been stunned by huge electric shocks, and Jim had a fair-sized burn to the back of his hand. We decided to call it a day, and went for a beer. It was at the pub that our common sense returned. Jim told me to not experiment with the device again. Too much chance of a serious injury or a heart attack, he said. But we did discuss what it had been in its pre- uh, what it, But we did discuss what had been its previous use in the house. I suspect it was used by a doctor or maybe a vet, said Jim. If I get time, I'll do some research and old medical electricals. Can I take it with me? We agreed on further investigation and went back to enjoying the pub atmosphere. A few days later, Jim rang to tell me that he had more information and that there should be some other parts for the device. Maybe I could find them somewhere in the house. It may have been used to knock people or animals out before procedures, he told me. Medicine was rough in the old days, he joked. I looked around for more parts without really knowing what I was looking for and without success, and then remembered the box of stuff which I had cleared from the cupboard. 
There were no electrical bits, but I did go through the stuff and found the medical handbook. The envelope still peeped out from the pages, and sitting in the kitchen with a hot coffee, I read the contents. The envelope was addressed to Mrs. Daoth, as the address here would have been in those days, well before the war, and the note was scribbled in a shaky hand with a fine steel nibbed dipping pen and ink on paper torn from a small notebook. The ink was blotched here and there with water droplets, or maybe, I now think, tears. It read, Dear Madam, I have been told by my young man that I need to take a dancing lesson with some urgency. He insists that we cannot be seen together again until I have had your lesson and that you will understand. I have seven pounds and four pence only in my savings, and I hope that this will be enough to pay for the lesson. I will travel alone to the village by train, and I will be waiting at the church gate on Sunday after the morning service. I will wear a blue felt hat with a feather and rose decoration so that you might recognize me. I wish that you can help me soon. With sincerest hope, J.L. P.S. I can get a little more after Easter. Well, make of it what you can. I mused over it for some time, as did my wife, and we both came to the same conclusion, this time with tears in our eyes. A time-old problem that many girls have faced, and sadly, many still do. This year, we started on the garden and decided that what we needed was somewhere to sit and relax in the summer, close to the sound of tinkling water. We proceeded to mark out a decked area and called in an expert to design and dig out a good-sized natural pond. The workers had gone down about three feet before they discovered the skull, and now forensics are carefully excavating the many bones. There may be several bodies. We are not allowed into our nicely restored house whilst investigations take place. We may never want to return anyway. The bones are all of young women, the sad victims of Mrs. Daoth's Dancing Academy and other services. We desperately hope that some survived to keep the secret of their unfortunate youth. We leave what went on in that terrible room to your imagination. That was written by Ken De Silva Hill. He's uh, sent me things in the past. You were probably wondering what on earth that last story was for. Why he was just rambling and rambling and rambling. But the end, I think, truly does make it worth the wait. Uh, if you want to hear more from Ken, um, he's not asking me to say this, but um, but I, I put him into the credits of those episodes that I use his stories in. So if you just go to WeirdDarkness.com and do a search for Ken Da Silva, D-A-S-I-L-V-A, Ken Da Silva dash Hill, you'll be able to find some more of his stuff if you're interested. Thank you very much for sending that, Ken. I need to take a real quick break and take a sip of something here because that was a really, really long uh, email. Uh, okay. This one comes from JB. Not sure if this counts as a story you can use for the Fireside Frights, as it was more of an experience while listening to your podcast rather than a spooky story, but just thought I'd pass it on. Love your podcast. I'm still trying to catch up with lots of last year's episodes as I have a couple of jobs and time is tight. Yikes, I have a great deal of listening to do. LOL. Anyway, I was enjoying, I was enjoying one of your now old Fireside Frights episodes, February 2023, and actually had the following experience while listening to it. In fact, I had to sit down to write you this email as soon as the episode finished. I was so emotional. So to give a little of my background, my mom passed away very unexpectedly during COVID, and we weren't allowed to be with her in the hospital. Oh man, that, oh JB, I'm so sorry. That COVID was so horrible for everybody, but that has got to be one of the toughest things that people went through. Losing family and not being able to go and say their last farewells. Uh, it, oh man, that, would be, that was, I'm so sorry, JB. Okay, I'm, I'll continue with your letter here, but uh, you're already pulling at the, at the heartstrings there. Um, so um, your mom passed away very unexpectedly during COVID and 
We weren't allowed to be with her in the hospital. We lived out of town, but it wouldn't have made any difference had we been able to get there. We still wouldn't have been able to be with her. Yeah. Um, we knew her time was drawing near, and we needed to figure out a way to say goodbye and let her know she wasn't alone and how much we loved her. The best we could do was say our goodbyes to her over the phone while someone held the receiver to her ear. We prayed and hoped that she could hear us. It was one of the most devastating experiences I've ever had, and it has always haunted me. Just not knowing. Did she hear us? Did our words penetrate her consciousness enough to be understood? Did she know that we were there with her, although not physically, but very much in spirit, and how much we loved her? I've always hoped for a sign from my mom that she's okay, and that she's with my dad, but up until today, I have never gotten one. So, now, how it related to your Fireside Frights episode, you ask? I'll try my best to explain it and hope it makes sense. I'm not sure if you remember this particular episode, but it involved a story from a woman named Tina. She wrote in about how all of her life she'd been very close with her grandma, and after her grandma became ill with dementia, she couldn't bring herself to visit her grandma at the nursing home as she didn't want to see her that way. Well, on Mother's Day, she was finally going to see her, but her grandma ended up passing before she could get there. After the funeral, her dad gave her an old black rotary phone that had been in her grandma's house and jokingly said something like, you know, for if grandma wants to get in touch. Well, later on, the phone did start ringing, and when Tina answered it, a particular song by Dolly Parton came through the receiver. Now, mind you, at the beginning of her story, Tina had only mentioned Dolly's name and that it involved one of her songs. Nothing about the song title, though. It was very strange, Darren. I'm listening to the podcast. You mentioned Dolly's name for the first time in Tina's story, and the words, I will always love you, literally pop into my head. Clear as day, just out of nowhere. You continue reading Tina's story and get to the part of how the song, I Will Always Love You, is heard through the phone. I'm like, what the heck? I just heard those words a few minutes ago. As soon as I heard that song play on the episode, a chill came over me and my body was completely covered in goosebumps. I burst out crying. In fact, I had to pause the episode to just have a good, long cry. I knew with all of my heart my mom had sent me a sign, and I was so happy and relieved. To make it even more strange, unlike other people, I'm not one to automatically connect the words I will always love you as a title of Dolly's. They definitely would not be foremost in my mind when you mention the name Dolly Parton. So for them to appear in my mind out of the blue is just bizarre. While I do like her songs, I'm not a huge follower, and to tell you the truth, I've always associated the song with another singer. Don't hate me, Dolly fans. <laughs> I get it, though. JB, I understand. Whitney Houston, that's the, when I hear that song, I think of Whitney Houston myself. Anyway, I just had to share this with you, Darren. For me, it just seemed too strange and too perfect to be a mere coincidence. In fact, I don't think I've ever had this type of visceral reaction to any of your other podcasts. And now as I'm typing this, I realized I was so focused and weirded out about the words I will always love you popping into my head that until just now, I completely ignored the connection with the phone. I used the phone to say goodbye to my mom, and her grandma used it to get in touch with Tina. Wow. Now it seems even crazier. How could I have just skipped over that? Good grief. And as I sometimes just hopscotch around to different episodes... It's strange that I found this episode when I did. I'll always be thankful I listened to, to this particular episode on this particular day. Talk about perfect timing. I just happened to listen to this particular episode today, May 13, 2024, the day after Mother's Day. Thanks for listening, and can't wait to catch up on all the episodes I've missed. I plan to be a lifelong fan. Signed, Jay. Wow. JB, man, th thank you um, so much. I, I appreciate you sending that to me and being so open, I guess, for lack of better words. It, 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 uh, it, be it means a lot to me that people listen and get something out of the podcast. I, I, created, I created Weird Darkness originally just because 
I needed a creative outlet. I was working at a radio station that I wasn't able to really be creative at. I loved the job. It's just I'm so used to being creative in my life. I've always had something to do with right-brained activity wherever I've been. And if I don't, then I find something else on the side. Like I used to be a singer and songwriter when I was working at a bank, just so I could have that creative outlet. Um, so working at a radio station where I wasn't creative, I was just like an announcer, I started doing Weird Darkness. And it was mostly for the creative outlet, but my, my prayer for it, my hope, was that it would just be an escape for people, you know? That it would just give people an opportunity to get away from the world just sit and listen for a half hour or an hour or however long that episode ended up being and just shut shut off everything for that amount of time. Just like a mini vacation to get away. Uh, in fact, I do that myself. I'll, I'll listen to my own episodes later on um, just to shut my mind off. It's it's weird what I lis listening, but listening back to them myself. It, I won't go into that, but it's, it's just a weird feeling. Uh, weird sensation listening back to my own voice telling the stories and it's almost like I'm hearing them again for the first time because I'm no longer concentrating on pronunciation and getting the right emotions and everything I'm just soaking it in um, but hearing from somebody like you and how an episode touched them especially in a way that would never have occurred to anybody I mean this is so out of left field that you would be listening to it and you'd get that connection with Dolly and the phone and Mother's Day and everything else. And I'm guessing nobody else listening right now has any clue as to what it felt like for you to go through that. We were prob we would hear this story and think nothing of it. It's just, oh, okay. Uh, that, that was a story that I was telling about Tina. Yeah, nice little story. But it caught one person. It caught you in just the right way it's stuff like this that that uh, just solidifies my faith that God truly does use some of the some of the weirdest things to reach people I mean who would think that God would use uh, a, a a paranormal true crime podcast to talk to people you would think that'd be the last type of that'd be the last thing he'd use right Um but I, I pray on, on, on a regular basis that the, that the show does reach people in a positive way. That somehow, you know, God's, God's hand can, can be felt as, as people listen. And there it is. You were, you were wondering and, and hoping, you know, that your mother had heard you over the phone. And for, for this to come through like that, that's just, that is amazing. I can kind of relate to what you were going through, too, because my dad, he passed away in October of last year. And there towards the end, we would try to have a phone conversation. And it was so, so hard because he um, his Alzheimer's was causing a, a type of dementia. And he would just go off on tangents. And either you didn't understand what he was saying because he wasn't making any sense. Or you couldn't understand it because he was mumbling. And so he just wasn't even making any words. He thought he was, but, you, but he wasn't. And so on the last the last time we were there to visit him he was pretty much gone um he was in bed he was unconscious almost the entire time he'd wake up a couple of times but yeah i kind of had that feeling like did he even know that i was here did, did he did he hear what i was telling him how much i loved him and how great of a dad he was and uh, how how much that of a man i am because of what he was to me and i would love I, I have no doubt that he knows that now. I don't, I don't need God to say, yes, he, you know, I'm not asking God to give me a sign or anything. I know he knows that because I told him that as well before he got sick. We, we've always been just like good buddies. And so we, we talked like that. But I understand that frustration of the, those, those last conversations, whether or not you were able to reach them. Um, JB, th thank you so much. I, I, again, I really appreciate you sending that in. I've got so many more emails here. I don't think I'm going to be able to get through them all. I might have to save them for another Fireside Frights because we're, we're coming up now on about an hour and 45 minutes. Okay. Well, I, I, can, I can go a little bit longer. Let me get another, another sip. Ugh. 
I always let you know what I'm drinking. This time it's just water. It's flavored water, but it's water. Uh, okay. This next one comes from uh, Jimbo. It says, how shall I begin? It was several years ago. I returned back to work after my dad had passed away. That particular uh, morning was normal as usual on the, gar on the garbage truck, except when I couldn't move my foot off the ground. I checked for debris and fishing string on the ground. I even raised my pant leg to check my boot lace. There was nothing on nor around my foot, so I started tugging. After a few good yanks, just like that, I was able to move my foot. Growing up, my dad did play a few pranks on me, but he was always that serious guy that you could rely on. Thank you for letting me share this moment in time. Signed, Jimbo. Short email. I like that you. <laughs> I like that your dad. Uh, you you put you put that on your dad. Like he's he's continuing to play jokes on you even even after he's gone. I, I love that. Um, all right, moving on to uh, Sass. She says I am uh, Sa Saskia, but everybody calls me Sass. I'm Dutch. 50 years old, married with two children, a son-in-law, and two grandkids. I, I've always been able to sense and hear the paranormal. Never did anything with it, simply because I'm not interested in doing that. I've seen what an evil presence can do. I'm convinced we would not walk away with our lives if we stayed any longer. Uh, I knew we were... Wait a minute. I'm convinced we wouldn't walk away with our lives if we stayed any longer. Okay, I, I, I said that right. I knew we were not the only family living in our apartment. We were just the only living family. They were benign, so it didn't bother me, and they liked keeping us and company entertained with their party tricks. Flickering lights, picture frames falling and missing objects, things like that. Nothing major. We'd hear Grandma's slippers, or someone, walking upstairs until my son was born. That was the moment things went from benign to evil very fast. No matter where my son slept, the thing was there. We started to get touched. Uh, we started to get touched sounds like hissing and growling. I'm not sure what a touched sound would be. Anyway, uh, people got scared in our home, and it kept people out. It definitely wanted my son. The moment I moved my family out was the day the glasses on some shelves exploded, and my husband got thrown from the kitchen into the hallway. I was out. I just hoped it didn't attach itself to my son. Luckily, that wasn't the case. The landlord made sure we got another house that same day, and he never rented that house again. After some research, we found out the family that lived on that spot in the house before the apartment was built was a Jewish family that got liquidated on the spot by the Nazis beginning in the Second World War. We think they were the benign ones. Why something try... Why something to try to take my son for its own, I didn't know. Now he's 20, and I know he's extremely empathetic, and if you talk with him, you can tell he lived lives before this one. He's wise beyond his years. Now I know he has a very open soul. Evil saw a chance and tried to take it. We never were bothered again, but I did take some precautions to make sure it would not happen again. With the help of a friend being a witch, she bound both children so they wouldn't be open for anything. We cleansed the house and made sure nothing could come in. Now, almost 21 years later, I'm still, I still keep these precautions up. I've seen my share, and it was more than enough. Thank you, Saz. Um, uh, this one comes from Darth Loki. That's not his real name, but that's, that's what we'll call him. Hi, Darren. Been listening to Weird Darkness for a while now, and you've even read one or two of my emails in your episodes. You're definitely a big part in my staying motivated to finish my bachelor's degree, and I'm anticipating that the same will be true as I start working toward... Hold on a second. Is that what I... I think this is... Hold on. Yeah. Darth, okay, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting off track here. Darth sent me a letter. This is, this is an email from him that I received May 21st, but he sent me a letter that really, really touched me. So I'm going to take, take a pause here, and I want to read this to you. 
th this meant so much to me when I when I got it. Um, this is this is not paranormal or anything like that. I, I really, this would be something that I would share in the chamber of comments if I was still doing that. But you know, I don't I don't really do those anymore. But he says, "Hi, Darren. Please excuse the handwriting. It's never been a strong area for me. But sadly, my printing is worse." That said, I wanted to share something with you, and whether you choose to share this on your podcast is entirely up to you. The large coin I've sent in this package is a McGowan medal, and it's part of a tradition at Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky. Each spring, graduating students are given a McGowan medal to give to a family member, friend, or mentor who helped them either get into Bellarmine, to, uh, Bellarmine navigate their time there, or succeed and graduate. This medal, named for the university's third president, Dr. Jay McGowan, is a way for each graduating student to thank that individual. So why am I sending mine to you, whom I've never met, yet had a uh, and never had a chance to meet? When I started taking college classes in 2004, I struggled because I couldn't find a field that interested me, and because the idea that after 13 years of general education, K-12, through as much as uh, half of the classes needed for college would be general ed, I gave it the uh, occasional, well, college try. But I gave up due to the same frustrations. I started listening to The Weird Darkness in 2021. I like that he says The, the Weird Darkness rather than just listening to Weird Darkness. Um, uh, I started listening in 2021, my first and so far only podcast, and in January of 2022, I started college again in my new state, Kentucky. I listen to you constantly while studying and doing homework, and in May of 2023, received a, a associate's degree and five certificates. I started taking classes at Bellarmine the same day in pursuit of a bachelor's degree and continued listening to Weird Darkness through all of my studying and homework on May 11th of this year, only a year after transferring, I completed my bachelor's and instead of struggling as I had previously, I finished with a 3.97 GPA. <laughs> Way to go, Darth. Um, I never, I never got a 3, even in high school, never got even close to a 3.9. Um, I was lucky if I got to a 3. Uh, but you did so much more than just help me finish homework, he says. The year before I found your podcast, I got married. Less than four months later, I moved out, and the only communication between us after that involved lawyers and a judge. Added to my uh, chronic pain from a deployment injury that's never healed, and I spent a lot of the last couple of years in depression. Darren, I want you to understand that I say the following with all possible sincerity. Nobody in this world has contributed more to the restoration of my mental health or to my successful completion of studies at Bellarmine than you. I know I've let this letter get awfully long, so let me uh, close by saying how grateful I am that you do you, that you do what you do, and add that nobody in my life is more deserving of this medal and what it represents than you. Thank you again, Darth. P.S. Because I know my writing can be hard to read, and he gives me his email. Um. Wow. Darth. I can't tell you how many times I've actually read this. It meant so nobody has done this this for me before. Nothing like this. I I don't deserve this this McGowan medal. Um, that you think that much of the podcast and what I do is it, it is humbling, man. So thank thank you. I, I wanted to share that with everybody else just because. I wanted everybody to know. Um, I, I guess I guess I wanted everybody to know how proud I am of you for getting through everything that you went through and actually getting your degree. I mean, with all the crud that you went through, and also, by the way, thank you for your service for getting in into the service and and doing that. I, I really appreciate that. I'm going to set this off to the side again, and uh, I will come back. Yeah, I'll go ahead and read the email now that you sent. I just, I just had to take that detour for a second. Okay. Hey, Darren, I've been listening to Weird Darkness for a while, and you've even read one or two of my emails in your episodes. You're definitely a big part of my staying motivated to finish my bachelor's degree, and I'm anticipating that the same will be true as I start working toward an MBA this fall. 
Now that I am constantly swamped in homework, I wanted to share the following for you to consider as an entry for Fireside Frights. I know parts, maybe even most of it, will sound somewhat crazy, but it's all as true as I can possibly vouch for. I've always been fascinated with mythology, the paranormal, the various beliefs that humans have held to explain the inexplicable and cope with the difficulties of the reality they faced. Even at a young age, I was researching as best I could the origins of stories like ghosts, werewolves, and the like. I went on many tours of places that were reportedly haunted, a pre-Civil War fort in eastern Wyoming, the Winchester House in San Jose, California, and was repeatedly disappointed that nothing happened at all. I tried to keep an open mind, but couldn't help starting to think that belief in ghosts and the like was akin to a, to a mass delusion. That is, until I was a senior in high school and went to hang out with a friend at his house. When I arrived, he and a couple of our other friends were in his room playing with a Ouija board. I don't know what all was said, but all three of them swore that they were communicating with something, until I rounded the corner and walked into the room. They all insisted that at that precise moment, the planchette stopped moving and absolutely would not respond. I have no idea what, if anything, that means, but they all thought it was scary that my presence would shut down a Ouija board. Fast forward a few years, and then, and my then fiancé, now ex-wife, and I were visiting old Sacramento so she could do a ghost hunt. While sitting in a small park next to one of the buildings using a Spirit Box app on her phone to ask questions, we both clearly heard the word EVIL, and when she asked for details, the response, RUN. At that moment, a thrown pebble hit the screen of her phone, despite there being nobody around who could have thrown it. The pebble definitely came from a lateral direction, not from anywhere above us, so it couldn't have been someone throwing it from the nearby building and ducking inside. She ran to leave the park, really just an empty lot where a building may have once stood, but having watched many episodes of a ghost hunting reality show and remembering the incident with the Ouija board, I stopped and just stood in the archway leading into the park. She had earlier said she sensed it was some sort of portal, just to see if anything would happen. For days after that, she had difficulty sleeping, and one morning said that she had woken up in the night and seen something standing over me. According to her, she had the very strong feeling that it was attached to me, but unable to do anything to me. I had no sensation of any presence whatsoever. It could, however, make life uncomfortable for her. She insisted that we each start wearing a rosary, and she no longer felt any oppression. Fast forward a couple more years, and I saw what I can only describe as the opposite of a shadow person, walking along a hedgerow. It was human in both shape and size, but all I could see of it was pure white. Oddly, I felt neither fear nor peace. As with what had once been supposedly hitching a ride with me, I felt nothing. However, I recently took a night tour at Waverly Hills Sanatorium in Louisville, Kentucky. On the fourth floor, I definitely saw heads peeking out of empty rooms. I checked inside them for anyone who may have been playing a joke, but didn't see or hear anything that could indicate a normal presence to explain it. I know you prefer one story per email, but I felt like the connection of these stories indicates a theme of growing ability to see what I once could not. Feel free to leave out the less interesting parts, should you decide to share any of it, and thank you for all the stories and entertainment that you provide. A long-time listener assigned to Darth. Darth, that is really cool. I've never heard of an, a reverse shadow person. Um, that is the first time... I've been doing this now since 2015, and of, of course I, I liked, you know, paranormal stuff before I even got started in this, obviously, otherwise I would never have begun it, but you know, getting into it in 2015, I'm really diving into it and reading so many different stories. And I have never, up until now, heard a story of a reverse shadow person. I don't even, what would you even call that? Pure white, it's not, it's not angelic. I don't think that would be an angel. It almost sounds like you were seeing a, an alien gray walking naked. You know, that that's the only thing I can, I can, see in my mind, and I know that's not what you're saying, but that is really weird. Darth, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate uh, everything that you've, that you've sent me. Um, okay, well, this one comes from somebody who want, wishes to remain anonymous. Uh, in fact, she calls herself Anonymous Cripple. So, okay. 
Uh, hi, I had at least one hit put out on me, and here's my story. I'll preface this with, you had a hit put out on you? Am I? Wow, okay, this is, uh, all right, this is going to be different. I'll preface this with some information that I promise is relevant once you get to that part of the story. One, in my prime, I was very, very good at martial arts. I have no self-confidence in any other aspect of my life, so I'm not just blowing smoke. Uh, I took to it very naturally and excelled quickly. I don't do it anymore, as my health has since declined, and I had a big falling out with the school owner. Two, I have a lot wrong with me, health-wise, most of which was underdiagnosed back then. I have Ehlers Danlos syndrome, which makes my connective tissue weak and flexible. I also have some sort of nervous system disorder that makes it hard for me to feel pain appropriately. Now, before anybody out there thinks that's some kind of cool superpower, it's not. I have broken bones and had serious injuries uh, before and had to be told about it secondhand. It's a dangerous condition that means every time I fall down or have reason to think I've been injured, I really need to be checked over by someone else to make sure I'm actually good. On the flip side, sometimes my pain response is inappropriate, as in very weak for a large problem or very painful for a small scrap. It's very annoying. Three. About three months before this story happened, I had helicoptered down a ski slope on my snowboard and tore the heck out of my knee. My family, being what they were, refused me care because I couldn't feel the injury anyway and it would ruin their trip. Yeah, parents of the year, those guys. But I knew something felt off and now, even at my age, I still just walk funny. Weirdly enough, the injury stiffened up that joint a little, and that became my stronger knee, along with the bracing I generally wore during competitions after the accident. 4. This was very long ago, and my memory ain't what it was, so forgive my gaps. Now, to the hit. As I had mentioned previously, I was extremely good at martial arts. I was on the Rockford, Illinois Elite. Ooh, Rockford. Hey, that's where I live right now. Anyway, I was on the Rockford, Illinois Elite competition team back in my 20s, meaning I had traveled around a lot to larger competitions out of state. I was also expected to be a scout of sorts, being sent either as a lone representative or with one or two others to new tournaments to see if it was safe or worth going to for the whole team later. As in, is the judging fair? Are the sparring matches governed safely? Is the atmosphere welcoming, etc., etc. It was at such a tournament that I had gone alone to that this came to light. I can't recall exactly where it was, aside from that I think it was in Illinois further south. The tournament itself was held in the basement of this large building. It was a fairly nice basement, however, carpeted, furnished. I think they even had a little cafe that was open. All in all, in, uh, initial impression was pretty good. I noted that the ceilings were a bit low, making it hard for people with larger weapons to do their sets. I did staff at the time and knew I would have to stunt the one toss my traditional instructor allowed of me. Um, there were also these large pillars fairly close together. I'm assuming load-bearing given the spacing and size of the pillars. They were about 4x4 four four feet squared floor to ceiling, about 10 or 12 feet, or about every 10 to 12 feet, making the rings a bit tight and the sidelines crowded. I was navigating around, trying to figure out where my rings were going to be, who the judges were, and who I was going up against, when I found one of the people I would be sparring later that day. I noticed they were taking some ibuprofen, smelled of tiger balm, and were in the process of strapping on a back brace. All signs of a recent injury. I asked if they needed a hand and introduced myself. We chatted for a while, and I made note of their uniform and face so I could pick them out later during our match and remind myself to take it easy on their back. I was good, but I wasn't a jerk. I felt that I left that interaction and was making my way back to my gear bag through the very crowded ringside when I found myself kind of stuck against one of the pillars and had to take a moment to look around for my next course of action. With how the rings were arranged around these obnoxious pillars, navigation was truly difficult, and I was stuck, kind of looking for a pathway back to where I wanted to go. While I was doing that, I thought I heard my name mentioned from an unfamiliar voice. I cued in and also heard my school name. I thought about announcing my presence, but for some reason, stopped. On the opposite side of the large pillar I was standing against was one of the people I was meant to spar later that day, and their coach and they were talking candidly about me. 
I don't recall exactly what they said, but it was something to the effect of, okay, so at noon, you'll be fighting blank. They have bad, blank being her. Now, they have a bad left knee, been wearing a brace for a while. Take the left knee out, okay? The left. We don't need them going to diamonds. If the judges call foul, I'll vouch for you that it was an accident. Can you make it look like an accident? Maybe fall over too. I need you to do this. And then proceeded the and then proceeded to coach the fighter in how to make an illegal knee kick look like an accident. I just kind of stood there in disbelief. Martial arts people are generally pretty cool people. Like you can trust them not to steal your stuff or do petty crap like this. But on the other hand, there is a dark side to the sport. You rub someone the wrong way and suddenly your points aren't being called and your matches are unbalanced. I've seen a lot of crap happen, but as I mentioned, I'm generally not a jerk, so I'm fairly well liked and respected. I was good, but I wasn't a jerk about it. As far as that dark side continues, though, you just don't you don't just roll up to someone with unfounded and unprovable accusations. I knew what I heard, but I didn't have a recording or even a second person to vouch for me. Making accusations in that community is dangerous, sometimes very dangerous. My next thought was my other opponent with the back brace. I did return to them, and that was the only other person at the tourney I told about it, worried that they'd do the same thing to them because of the back brace. I don't think they believed me, though, but I figured, well, that's on you. I did what I could to warn you. I ended up facing my opponents later that day, both of them, and managed to win both matches with my knee intact, though several very uncertain attempts were made. I like to think the coach was corrupt, but the student had better morals. I did report back to my school that this was not a tournament we should be endorsing, however. I often wonder just how many failed attempts at ending my career there actually were. Funny, it should be my own coach who did it for them. Signed, Anonymous Cripple. Sounds like a scene out of Karate Kid, man. Uh, when you said you got a hit out on you, I was almost thinking, oh my gosh, somebody's going like to bring in a gun to you or something. Be careful how you, how you word things. <laughs> uh, okay, this next one comes from, uh, they call themselves Mr. Lips. Okay. Hey, Darren, it was the year of 1976 that my parents bought the house in Grand Rapids, Michigan, on the northeast end. The house was already over 100 years old, and it was built kitty corner from a cemetery. Me and my older brother and sister would ride our bikes often without thinking much about it. It was in 1977 that I went bike riding with my neighbor. We started racing each other, starting at the top of the hill with their large family. Uh, at the top of the hill, that. Oh, okay. We started racing each other, starting at the top of the hill there, where there was a large family crypt, and there's there were two smaller family crypts also with the dates of 1892 to 1923. It was in June 77 I was riding my bike and hit a fallen tree branch and crashed my bike. When my neighbor came back to check to see if I was okay, he started walking backwards away from me. He started yelling, who's whipping that blood from your leg and uh, who's wiping that blood from your leg and arm? Nobody. Get my bike off of me so I can get up and continue riding around. Once again, he yelled, no, who's wiping the blood off of you? A man who was working in a cemetery, starting preparations for a funeral service, came running over to help me. He asked me if I was if it was the fallen tree branch that had caused me to crash my bike. I said, no, there were two people standing in the road in the cemetery that wouldn't move out of my way. And when I was getting closer, it felt like someone just grabbed hold of my bike and stopped me on the spot. The guy who was working asked my friend if he had seen it happen. He said that me and my bike left the ground and twisted in a weird way, and that the two people standing in the road started coming towards us. That the um, <clears throat> that he seen the blood being wiped from my legs and arms. The man worked uh, working asked if those two people that we had seen were dressed in older styles of clothing. Yes, one was wearing like a top hat, and the other one was wearing a black bonnet style. The guy working in the cemetery that day said, "You've seen the two people." who were the first family members in the large crypt. Be careful of the other family members also. That the family passed in a fairly in a uh, ferry accident in northern Michigan in the 1800s to the Upper Peninsula. We kept on riding our bikes in the cemetery over the years. It always seemed like someone was watching us. It was in 1982 or 1983 when a person who was working in the cemetery 
found the lady who killed herself and her daughter by hanging from a tree by the large family crypt. My father is laid to rest in that cemetery on the northeast end of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and my grandparents also. Until I see my family once again, thank you, Mr. Lips. That would be so, that's that, fe that feels like a like a movie scene. Somebody you, seeing the, the blood being wiped away from you, but, but not but not knowing like being in, invisibly being wiped away from you. I, that just feels like a movie scene to me. Uh, okay. Let's see, this next one, ooh, Hat Man Encounters. Should I save this one for the next? No, all right, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, tell you what, I'll do this one. How long, how long, I've been, uh, I've been going for a little more than two hours. I'll tell you what, I'll finish with this one, and then I'll do another Fireside Frights next month or something and try to pick up uh, with more of these. Uh, so I'll, I'll end. Yeah, I'll end with this one because my, my voice is <laughs> my voice is starting to go. Uh, this one comes from Susan. She says, "Hey Darren, love listening to you. I had to change my listening strategy at work because the school I was at literally had no cell service. The school resource officer couldn't even use her radio. I could pull up Weird Darkness on my computer, but other podcasts were blocked. During testing season, I couldn't even access YouTube, but I had Weird Darkness, so." I get your podcasts for six hours a day. Loved it, and I appreciate how much work you put into it. Anyway, attached is my two Hat Man stories. You can use my pen name, S.M. Kirkland. Keep up the amazing work. Oh, well, I'm sorry, I, I should have used your, your pen name. I, I used Susan instead. Sorry, but I only used your first name, so you, your, privacy, your privacy is still okay. Uh, okay, so let's go to that, what you had said, the, the, the Hat Man encounters. All right. I've had paranormal encounters all of my life. Some periods, like early childhood, were rampant with experiences. They decreased in early adulthood, but have started to increase over the last two or three years. These encounters have included seeing full-body apparitions, psychic phenomena, and sleep paralysis. I never encountered Hat Man until last year. In the last year, I've had two experiences with this entity. The first time was in the summer of 2023. We live on a small farm in northwest Georgia, and our laundry closet is in the kitchen next to the back door. One evening, my husband had taken the washing machine onto the back porch. In the Facebook group, I mistakenly said dryer, but it was the washer. He needed to do some maintenance on it. I went into the kitchen to the closet and opened the door to get something, and there, my, where my washer had been, was the hat man. He was sepia-toned, so that I could see his form and the outline of his trench coat and fedora but I couldn't see specific details. I wasn't afraid, although I was surprised since I wasn't expecting to see someone in my laundry closet. I held up my hand to him and said, hold on. I've listened to so many paranormal podcasts that it didn't rattle me at all. Going into my bedroom, I grabbed a bottle of anointing oil and went back to the closet. He was gone, but I applied oil and prayed that if he was something ominous, that he'd not return. I didn't feel like it was harmful, but I wanted to cover all the bases. My husband is not a paranormal believer, so I don't even think I told him. I did call my best friend, who told me that she'd seen him many times and had never been afraid. We were both passionate believers in Christ, so we do our best to discern spiritual matters. The second time was over Thanksgiving weekend last year. It's a big deal, and my adult children and their significant others come over, and we usually invite friends who may not have family. My middle daughter and her husband lived on our property at the time, so they came over with their two dogs, Jax and Charles. After eating, excuse me, after eating, we were all hanging around outside. It's Georgia, so Thanksgiving is pretty mild, temperature-wise. As I've mentioned, we live in the country and gunfire isn't uncommon as people target practice or even hunt. We do our best to put all the dogs in the house when we hear gunfire and thought they were all put up, but Jax, unbeknownst to us, had not gone in. Apparently, he spooked and ran. When he realized it a few hours later, everyone searched for him well into the night. I stayed at home, and Casey showed back up, but eventually went to bed. Later that night, I was asleep, facing the middle of the bed when I felt a hand squeeze my upper arm. It startled me awake, and I heard a voice say, they are bringing him home. It sounded similar, but not exactly like my husband, and I turned over, thinking Jax must have been hit and killed. 
I felt so sad that when I turned over, I saw a black form beside my bed. I could make out the coat and fedora, but it was more solid than the previous one. I couldn't see through him, but the room was mostly dark, so that could be an, uh, a contributing factor. I didn't know how to respond because we all loved Jax. My son-in-law had owned him for seven years and he was a good boy. I'm still thinking it's my husband, even though he doesn't own a trench coat or a fedora. I turned back over and my husband was in bed with me. I prayed for my daughter, son-in-law, and Jax and pondered what this could mean. We continued our search daily and were overjoyed when Jax returned home two days later, tired and hungry, but other than a small cut on his leg, he was fine. But it perplexed me more because I wanted to understand the message. Eventually, I put it out of my mind. Until January 2024, Jax went to bed fine, eating, drinking, and playing normally, other than a slight cough. The next morning, he was so sick, he couldn't get up. Son-in-law and daughter took him to their vet, and then to an emergency vet in Chattanooga about an hour from us. X-rays showed he had pneumonia, and the vet found a small puncture wound that had healed. The vet believes he was wounded when he got out and the pneumonia started then, but took that long to become full-blown. He held on for two days before crossing the Rainbow Bridge, leaving us all heartbroken. Jax had this adorable, goofy habit of letting out a random little bark every couple of hours, almost like he was reminding us he was there. After he passed, my border collie, Ozzy Cross, who rarely barks, like twice a year, looked up toward the front door and let out a little bark. I think Jax just wanted us to not forget him, and we won't. I love that. Thank you, SM. That, that's a great way to end tonight. There were other emails that I did want to get to, uh, other stories that were sent in. It's just the voice is not lasting. Uh, so I will uh, call it quits for now, but I'll definitely uh, be doing another Fireside Frights in the near future. So thank you for, for listening, everybody. If you like the show, um, this is, again, something that I don't normally do. This is not my daily show. This is just a Fireside Frights where once a month or every three months <laughs> in this case. I need to do it more often. I'm sorry. But uh, if you did like what you heard, um, uh, please let, uh, let somebody else know. Uh, let, tell people about the podcast. That's really what means more to me than anything else. Um, and if you have a story yourself, something that's creepy that's happened to you or somebody you know, uh, send it in for a future Fireside Frights. Just go to WeirdDarkness.com, click on Tell Your Story, and you can send it in. And all the stories that I shared tonight by you they are from you, the listeners, not, not from uh, outside authors that I've searched or anything else. These all came directly to me, and they are all purported to be true, and uh, there you go. So, um, now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 John 2, verse 17, The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. And a final thought. By acting as if I was not afraid, I gradually ceased to be afraid. Theodore Roosevelt I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me, weirdos, in the weird darkness.